Thank you everybody for coming to the session. I'm Andrew, this is John, and we're gonna do ArcGIS API for Python and talk about some advanced scripting. The first thing we're gonna talk about is what is the ArcGIS API for Python, and what it is is a, it's a library and it's a collection of tools and classes that you can use to work with your web GIS. It's built on, it's very powerful and it follows modern practices, and we designed it to be easy to use. Like I said before, it's powered by your WebGIS, but it also has local capabilities. So it has the ability to take and use ArcPy for some of the functions on the back end, it's like a geometry engine, but you can also take advantage of things like geoanalytics and regular analysis, the, like the things you would do if you go to your map and you add data on it, a web map, and you do maybe um, interpolation and things like that. It's made for automation and data science, and we're not really gonna talk about the automation side of it, but if you were to break the Python API into two parts, there really is an automation side where you could manage the nuts and bolts of your servers, your, your hosted notebook uh, servers, your portals, your whole enterprise infrastructure, right down to the nitty gritty. And then there's the whole data science side, which we're gonna focus on here. So what can it do for you? Like I said, it can do two things. There's your administrator and DevOps, so if you're break, to break people up into groups, you can work with your users' roles and group management, and also manage people's concepts, and that's very important for administrators. There's also a branch that's content publishers, and these folks are the people who create data, maybe host layers, and they're probably the author authoritative folks that put up new content. And then you have your analysts, and these are the people who get down and dirty with your information. And they have the ability to leverage things like big data and raster analytics and feature analytics as well. And then you have your power users, and these are your users who sort of stretch all those other aspects across the whole API. And this builds a Pythonic representation of your GIS, all powered by the Python API. And what we have here is we have just our little graphical representation of everything that's in the API. And we're gonna start out by talking about the GIS module, because everything starts there. The GIS module contains, um, contains a lot of entryways into different parts of your GIS. You can access your content, you can manage users, groups. You can modify the system properties from the GIS object if you're an administrator. And those groups lend themselves to other parts of the API. So for an item, you can update the content and the properties. You can access managers that allow you to create and get resources. You can create new users and modify what they can do and change their roles. And you can create new groups as well to sort of segment out users into the same, uh, in, into logical categories. Maybe you have a, a Department of Transportation group or a planning group. So let's take a look at how we use this in a demo. So the first thing when we talk about using the GIS is how do we connect to this GIS? And it starts with this. So you can do from GIS, import GIS, or from ArcGIS, import GIS. And you can connect many different ways. The first way is anonymous. That means you're going to a site and you, we don't know who you are and you can access any publicly available data. And this is done by doing, you instantiate your object, so you do GIS and you don't pass in any parameters. Without passing any parameters, you collect, connect to ArcGIS Online. You can use named users, which is just a username and password, and that's where you give a username, your password, and you connect to ArcGIS Online if we didn't provide a URL. You can also do this connection to a portal as well by, by providing a URL. But here what we're doing is something that I strongly recommend everyone to do. We're developing what's called a profile. And it's a secure way of storing your username and password, so every time you create a notebook, you don't have to go back and type in that username and password. So if you're gonna use a, a, a scripting product or even a, a notebook and you're gonna share it, you shouldn't ever put your username and password in there. So once we create our profile, which I called ABCD, I can go ahead and recreate it again just using that profile name. 
So once it's created, all your scripts can reference it by that name. It's not, it's not required to be running in the same notebook every time. It stores the information in your operating system's credential store. And this will work on Mac, this will work on Windows, and this will work on Linux. So it can be across the platform. So if you have standardized names for profiles and you set them up on all your machines, you never have to type in that username and password again. You can see who you are when you log in by doing gsuser.me, uh, me, and it brings back yourself. And in Jupyter Notebooks, it gives a nice graphical representation of who you are and what you look like. You can log in in other people as well and get back the information. So instead of being the demo account that I created before, I could be myself on my organization on ArcGIS Online. We can connect to Enterprise as well, so our portal. And I'm using profiles once again. Notice I didn't have to state the URL for my portal because that also gets stored in the credential manager. There's multiple resources when it comes off the GIS. So we're gonna connect to my organization, my Dell Dev organization, ArcGIS Online. And we're gonna access a user. In this case, I'm gonna access my fellow colleague's user account, Rowit. And I can start looking at information about him. I can look at his first name and last name. And you'll notice this supports two syntax. It supports the dot notation syntax, and it also supports the accessing properties by dictionary key. We can search for additional users by doing your gis.users, and that gives what's a user manager, and we can do a search. You can either search by a query string, or you can get back all users within your organization. So I'm just doing a generic search and pulling everybody in. And then you can access those users as well. So I'm just grabbing the third user in our array and I'm just printing out and getting the nice for this demo account here. You can also search for items on that user. So I, I grab that our demo account and I want to see what content that, that user owns. So as an administrator, this could be very key for you. You're allowed to go into their, their account and print out the various information and you can go ahead and manage it and you can either see what they have and use it for yourself or you could delete it and update it if you're an administrator. If you're a power user, you can just access it and use it if it's shared. The GS object also allows you to manage groups like I mentioned before. And here we're gonna create, we're gonna access uh, the LA County emergency group that we created on our site. And we can see the information that's associated with it. So just like you notice with the users, you get that nice graphical interface of how a group can be represented to you. Just like accessing a user content, we can access a group's content the same way. And what you'll notice about the pattern as we go through this is that there's familiarity from classes to classes as you go along. So what you do with a user basically follows the same pattern of what you would do with a group. So you don't have, each class doesn't have this huge learning curve. We can then go ahead and search for content as well, and that, acts, that uses our content manager. So you can use gscontent.search and pass in um, either a query string or nothing and get back all the content either for our site or for a specific query, and we can display those items. And in notebooks, it gives back a rich HTML representation of it, but these are item objects. And you can see we have quite a bit of information here. You can query individual items and see who owns them. You can update the properties if you're the owner or an administrator. And you can also see what items are related to it. So this means if you have a, a service and it's in a web map, you can find the relationships back and forth between those web maps and services. Or if you have a service and you need to figure out where it's, um, where the item came from that it was published from, those associations exist within Enterprise and ArcGIS Online, and the GIS object allows you to access that information. If, if you control your own enterprise and you're not using ArcGIS Online, you get additional capabilities to manage your system. You can access the administrative side using your GIS object and manage your federated resources. So if we could connect to our enterprise and we do .admin as an administrator, we get access to a whole wealth of information. And this gives you an admin, administrative manager. And we can get a hold of our servers this way and we can list them out. So, so this enterprise that I'm connected to has three servers. You can get a server by its type. So if I wanted to, if there was a problem with my geoanalytics server, I could do servers.get and say the functionality that I wanted to grab 
and it'll return back that individual server. If you had more than one, it'll come back in that list. If you want to access the hosting server, you could pass in the role of hosting server. In this case, it was returning two, but I only wanted to use the first one, because we have a multi-federated uh, site. I can then go on that server and access the individual services for each folder level that's on our server. And I can, I can start, stop, and delete and on the base level and even update extensions on the services. So you can do anything you, you can do from the Arch ArcGIS server's administrator page, you can do using the Python API for ArcGIS. You can pull statistics to see how, how, um, how busy a service is or if it's being used. And, and you can look at it per machine by just doing a service.statistic. And we can start and stop them and check the status. So that's a little overview of the JS module. So now we're gonna go back And we're gonna move on and we're gonna start talking about the feature modules and I'm gonna hand it off to John. Did the screen change, is mine up there? Okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm John and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the one of the particular modules in the API, the features module. This is how you're m modeling your feature data within your web GIS. So Andrew talked a little about the main GIS module, the entry point into your GIS. The API's architecture is modular in a Pythonic way and the features module is one of the fundamental modules of data set architectures. And you can see there's some categories here, the, these blue ones, we've got some processing modules and also some visualization modules that I'll go into a little bit later. Um, just to introduce the features module to you and how things are modeled within this module, the, what you publish as and know as a feature service is modeled, is modeled in the GIS as a feature layer collection object. And from that feature layer collection object, the layers and tables within that feature service are modeled out of that in a class, in a feature layer or a table class, respectively. So from a feature layer collection, you can get a list of your tables and your feature layers out of there. From the feature layer object, you, or the table object, you can query those to get feature set objects, which are often used as inputs to geoprocessing tools, and you can also draw those and visualize those feature set sets directly on the map widget that is part of the API. And so one, and once you have that feature set, that's how you get access to all the individual features, which are modeled as a feature in each feature layer. So those are the name of the classes. Out in the API documentation, under the features module, you can see the particular documentation for all these classes and then what your methods and properties are off of each of those. So that is kind of a brief, and then you have a set of feature analysis tools to work on, on these feature layers and features within, within those, this module. So from here, where I'm gonna go is, let's just do, let's do a quick demo of showing how to access features and, and make a quick edit in a, in a feature layer. So I've connected to a GIS system here and I'm gonna go and search for a particular feature layer. So I've got the feature layer collection that's come up and I'm gonna look at that and just get a quick, rich HTML display of that item that is in my, in my portal. And 
I always sort of, when, when I'm working with the API, one of the things that I've struggled with as I've learned Python is, is knowing what type of object that I have with, with certain commands. So I think this Jupyter Notebook environment, this quick way to visualize and sort of line by line go through code has helped me understand what type of object I have and then I can go into the API reference and sort of look up what I can do off of each of these objects. Um, and for someone like me who does not have a super developer-y background or computer science background, that has been probably the only reason why I can use this API and Python at all is by doing things like this that are, uh, let me know exactly what I'm working with. So anyway, so when I search in a portal, I get back a list of the, t of the items that I searched for. So I have to go into that list and actually get things from it. So right now I'm working with an item and when I look at the URL, I can see that it ends in the word feature server. That's how I know I'm working with a feature layer collection object. So I'm going to import that feature layer collection class from the features module and I'm gonna use the URL from the item to, to instantiate a feature layer collection object here in my notebook. And from that feature layer collection, as we talked about in that diagram, I can get a list of the layers that are in this feature layer collection. So I've got four layers within there and I'm going to go query out that first layer and again use my super useful type function to figure out what do I have a hold of right now. So here I've got a feature layer. So the feature layer collection layers property returns to me a list of the feature layer objects within the feature layer collection. So logical. Okay, so let's access one of these feature layers and do something with it. So again, I'm gonna get my list and I'm gonna list out the name of each feature layer that's, that's in there. And then I'm going to create a variable referencing one of them and I'm gonna start to look at, at this. I've got, here's the extent of this particular layer and I'm gonna then quickly visualize. What, I wanna take a look, what does this look like? What am I, what am I working with? So I'm, in, I'm creating a map widget. So within the module, we have created a, a map widget that which references our JavaScript API and can use uh, the Jupyter Notebook environment to draw a map real quick. I'm gonna add this layer to it and see that's not so great, right? So I'm gonna zoom in on it and change one of the properties and see, okay, I've got a layer of some cities. All right, so I talked a little bit about that feature set object that you can get by querying a feature layer. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to, again, I make, I use the query method on that feature layer variable and I'm entering in a, a simple where clause just to limit what's returned to me. And again, I check what type of object I look at. I'm looking at, I'm using a feature set right now. Okay, I've got point objects. So this is just, and I'm looking at the spatial reference here. Okay, so I'm just getting some information about my, about my feature set. Okay. Now I've got this SDF property on a feature set, which can return all my objects to me as a, a pandas data frame. So again, I check what type I'm working with. There I've got a data frame object. So there I can see my features and some information on what my attributes are. And let's drill down further into this feature set and get individual features. So I use that features property on a feature set, I get a list return back to me, a list of the features. I'm gonna say, how many features do I got? I've got seven that responded in my query. Again, that's my handy method to figure out, okay, so now I'm working with, when I look at one of those items from that list, I've now got a feature object. And I create a variable to that, and now I can get things like the attribute column names from my feature. Now I'm gonna actually edit one of these features. So I set up a list comprehension to return to me 
one particular feature. This one is New York, right? And I'm thinking, okay, this is a, this is a feature set about cities, but my attribute value is New York. It'd be more useful if I change that to New York City. So I make a deep copy of this feature set, of this feature object I'm working with because the feature object has other objects within it. And if you don't make a deep copy, you're referencing the original feature. So if you change it, your edit's not gonna stick. So you've gotta use a deep copy when you're using compound objects, when, when you're copying things with compound objects. So here, I'm changing that value of New York right, to New York City. And I see now I've got that new value in here. And I'm gonna call the edit features method and use this New York edit that I've just created to update that feature set. And then I'm going to look at, and I'm verifying that now this is returned to me. So that is a quick demo of the features module and making a quick edit in a feature layer. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrew to continue on. All right, thanks, John. So now we're gonna move on to another part. So the, uh, what John showed was how to work with vector data. And now we're gonna talk about how you can e use raster data to do some analysis. We can use the Python API to work with raster data. So, and we can do very complex analytics on that data as well. And it's pretty neat. So it all starts once again from accessing your GIS and we're gonna log in. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab some Landsat data that's hosted by ArcGIS Online. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I can look at some of the properties. So this is sort of unique uh, thing that we can do with Landsat. So if we want to access the items description, we can use this HTML property and it'll bring in all this real, like that really rich display that you would get if you were to look at the data on the items page, we can also bring it into a cell below. And we can look at the information we want. And we notice what we have here is we have all our band information. And really, you need to understand what bands you have with your data before you can start doing analysis. Because different band combinations produce different results, and you have to know what you're looking at before you can go ahead and just do the different uh, raster functions. So now that we know that, we're gonna go out and just see what the default looks like. So we're gonna access our Landsat item and look at the first layer in it. And what you notice is you notice this image pops up. So, in, so like an item when you got the really rich display, Raster Analytics creates an in-memory snapshot of the whole raster. So this is at the full extent of the Landsat data. And this is existing in memory on your, on your computer. And we can go ahead and explore the different wave, uh, wavelengths. We can leverage pandas by doing import pandas as PD. And we can also take the properties within that Landsat layer and we can display them as data frames. We can then go ahead and visualize it. So the default view of the Landsat imagery is just natural color. This is a New York, New Jersey area. We're gonna add our Landsat using map.add layer and we can add it. We can then go ahead and we can run raster functions on there. So raster images have these built-in functions that give some very common display. And as it goes through, you can see the bands actually updating and adding it to the map as we go along. And these are all in-memory snapshots of the information. And it goes through the various bands and colors. More specifically, we can look at, we can apply the, those different raster functions to get the color set, like color infrared with DRA. We can just apply that and work with that in memory. So we, we're not creating a new raster image on server, we're just working with it locally in our data set. Just like we did before when we looked at the default view, now we're looking at this, the color infrared here. We can then put that on a map. So we can apply it to a map. We're gonna look at an area over in Redlands. 
and we can pan and zoom. And what you'll see is as I moved, you saw the street map view because that extent wasn't rendered yet. But as I pan and zoom and zoom in and zoom out, it actually on the fly creates our image for us and re-renders it on the map. It's pretty neat and it's pretty powerful. We can geocode areas and go to new extents as well. So you saw me manually panning it, but we can also take that color infrared um, area and if we're, we know the area we want to work with, we can set that extent. In this case, I'm only taking a snapshot of Washington DC in this case. We can pass that extent to multiple different types of, of um, imagery so and the different band combinations so you can get a quick visualization of all these different of what the imagery looks like as you're going along so maybe you don't know the right band combination or the right way you want to display it and you're looking for a specific type maybe you're looking for vegetation indexing or you want to know change over time and you want to specifically look at um, or you're trying to find water and things like that, uh, you could visually look through there and see if the feature that you're trying to extract or analyze against is there. And we can also export the image. Once we know the area we want and we find the band combination that we want, we can save this image to disk. And you just take your layer and export image so we've already defined the band combination that we want. So all you have to do is say export image, pass in that extent and the size you want the image and it'll save it to disk. So what we have here is the image file is actually a path and I'm just taking advantage of Jupyter Notebooks and displaying it back on there so instead of just seeing a uh, file path. And here's the same exact thing, what the file path actually looks like. And here's it displayed. I did it quite a number of times. Um, the next thing you can look at is um, here's some, we can also apply the raster functions like we showed before. So here's some more examples of this. So this is NDVI colorized over the Washington DC area. We can then also do extract and stretch specific bands. So we can chain operations together that apply on our, that, that work on our raster data set. We can clip our data to area of interest that we want. So let's say we wanted to look at information around Redlands, California. We, we could pass in a geometry and buffer it, or we can even use geo enrichment and pull out the named areas. So if there's a specific zip code or county that you're working with, you could just select that, pass in that geometry and extract what you want. So uh, here's the Redlands area and the bands I want to work with. You can get a quick visual representation of the area that you're working with. Uh, geometry objects now support SVG rendering. So here's the Redland zip code that I extracted out. So you can now see what your, your band image should look like. And if we were to go ahead and clip it, whoops. You can see the, the, the geometry that we clipped out before for the, the Redlands area for that zip code. Another um, collection of imagery that we have access to, if you use ArcGIS Online, is the Sentinel-2 data, which is provided by the European Space Agency. And this is a great set of data to work with. It's multispectral and it has really, it's, it's really detailed imagery for the whole world. So we can look at some of this information and not only can we pull out pieces of information, just whatever is viewed at this moment, we can pick out not only by extent, but also by date times. So if you know a time, you're looking for a specific event happened, so you have a fire or a flood that's going on, you can pull out that imagery and do analysis against it. You can also filter by cloud cover as well. So you have this cloud cover field that's associated with, the, uh, with the, each image, and these are the percentage of cloud cover in the whole the whole image as a whole. So the higher the number, the less you can actually see below you because you have that cloud cover. And you can leverage pandas to do the, the, um, the daytime indexing for the acquisition date. You could set that as an index. And let's say you're looking for today, March 7th, uh, you know, let's say you want to look at what it looked like here in Palm Springs a year ago, you would just pass in March 7th, 2019 and the extent of Palm Springs and would bring back all tiles that fit within that extent. You can also select the newest imagery for an area and the last imagery. 
So here's an example of getting the last data set that was taken for my area interest here. And then if I want to do, uh, I'm sorry, it was the newest one. And then if I wanted to get the oldest one for this, I could also just say, give me the first image that covered our extent. So now you have, you're just gathering all the information from, from the, the newest to the oldest. And then you can go ahead and take differences of the imagery on the bands that you want, take the difference and stretch them, and then develop a difference raster. Then you could take that in-memory raster data set that we've been working with, persist it on your, on your organization, and continue doing further analysis or share it out for the users who need to use this and derive additional informational products. So now we're gonna go back. So that ends the raster analytics portion. We're gonna go back and we're gonna take a look at, oh, sorry, I lost my spot. We're gonna talk about geocoding next with John. He's gonna do a demo on geocoding. Okay, geocoding, right? Taking addresses, turning them into lat long so you can look at them. Okay, so within the API, there is this geocoding module, right? and there's a list of the classes and functions that you can use off this geocoder class. And let's just jump in and do some actual geocoding. So the geocode function in this module can handle uh, all different kinds of address formats. We're just gonna go through a couple different ones. I imported the module and I'm going to, uh, appropriately enough, we're gonna take a look at what comes up when I ge run the geocoding function with Palm Springs, since that's where we are. Um, okay, so I can see that my results are big and long and messy looking, right? So I've got when I first ran this and, and I get 20 results back, I don't, that I was like, I don't. What am I getting? What are all? The, what are all these results I'm looking at? The, the easiest way I think to then filter through that is take a look at all right, what what got the highest scores and what is the actual address that that's returning back to me? So, um, and it looks like that first one indeed is what I'm looking for. Right? So, um, let's take a look at just that that first result. Right, we see I get a dictionary back with all kinds of information about what I just geocoded. And then I'm gonna go ahead and draw another map here and take a look at where this is, right? Since that is kind of the point of geocoding. So I draw my map using the map class and I'm gonna change some properties so I get a little bit better view and create a symbol real quick, and let's draw that first result. Bam, there it is. So, we geocoded Palm Springs. Let's take a look at, all right, where we are right now, Convention Center, and again, I'm getting three results back, two of them with a score of 100. Let's take a look at what these differences are. How am I gonna verify what, what results I wanna look at? So I'm gonna loop through the, these results and map all of them. And so I created different symbols and there I've got two of them are, right if I zoom in on there, right, there's the convention center. And that one is the wrong, is not what I'm looking for. So that's quick intro of how you just geocode a place name and a single line address. Let's talk about geocoding a multi-field address, like in this different format here. So I entered in a specific address and I get two results back. This I think is City Hall. And again, I can create a couple different symbols and put those on the map. And then I zoom in and yeah, there's one of them's much better than the other.
Okay, let's take a, we're gonna search within a, a specific extent now. So if I, again, geocode the convention center and then put that and then draw a map of where I'm at, then I can geocode with some of these kind of categories that are in the geocoder. So let's take a look at some nearby restaurants here at the convention center. Make sure my map is empty. And again, I'm gonna just use the draw method on the map to draw the results of this geocoding operation. And there I've got a, a list of six nearby restaurants based on the extent value of what I geocoded. There are indeed six here because some of them have, there's one of, some are close together. So there's a, a quick way to geocode some results and get some information about where you're at and what's nearby. So batch geocoding, I'm going to get my GIS, and then I can enter in a list of addresses and use the batch geocode function on that list of addresses and take a look how many results I got six back, same length as my list, draw the map, Nope. And zoom in, and let's take a look at where my results are. So there, indeed, again, are my results geocoded on the map. Some different, those are actually some famous houses here in Palm Springs. If you're an architecture person, this is it's kind of a big deal around here. Okay, reverse geocoding. Let's take, let's take a look, let's enter in some lat long values and see what we get back here. So there it looks like I've geocoded a latitude longitude coordinate into a particular location. I'm gonna draw a map. And draw my results on it. That's not a very good symbol I chose, but there indeed it is. Okay, and one last thing, this is a quick way to draw a function where I can make a map, define a function, and then click on the map to get the, to get the information back to me about where I just clicked. So that's a way to, those are some different ways that you can geocode and use geocoding within the Jupyter widget like this, the Jupyter Notebook. Great, thanks John. Okay, so we're gonna switch back and we're gonna talk about network analysts. This is the next extension. So you know where your points are, but how do you get from point A to point B? And, and that's one of the common problems that you can use network analysts for. So we're gonna find, we can use it to find the best route, we can find closest facilities, we can identify service areas, and all the stuff you, you, know, you do with network analysts. So we have the ability to construct drive times based on time, and I'm gonna start by logging into my ArcGIS. And I'm gonna access the service area using the network, ArcGIS.network, and use the service area layer. We're, so, um, each organization and enterprise should have an associated URL that points to your network analyst service. So you're, if you don't have one set up or you don't get a URL back, like by checking this property, you need to contact your administrator and find out what's going on. But by default, all ArcGIS Online uses this route.arcgis.com service. And we can instantiate our new service area layer. We can go ahead and we can geocode, let's say the Palm Springs Center and we can display it on a map. And now we have two points put on there. But let's say we wanted to compute the service area. So we can go in and we can calculate our service area and we can specify how we're getting from point A to point B. So you can say either I'm walking or driving or you're a truck or just a regular car. And we can pass this into the solve service area method that exists on that layer that we had. 
So we pass it in and we give it our default breaks. In this case, it's time in this instance in minutes. And we pass it, we're going to use the truck mode from getting for our service area. So we're going to reread the results back into a feature set and visualize it on a map. And what you see is you get all your drive times for the various minutes. So I used RGBA values and I passed them in for the 5, 10, and 15 minutes distance that you can drive. Notice that there's overlap for each one because what you can cover in that 5, you can also cover in that 10. So that's why some of the colors look slightly different when you look at the green, orange, and red. You can also get driving directions and not just showing a line on the map. So if we want to go between um, the White House and this uh, and Rayburn Hobbs Road in DC, we can do some batch geocoding and we can wrangle it. So we can do some, let's say we want to get the reverse geocoding for these two addresses and get them back. So here's our two stops. We're gonna pass this into our, our solve method and this is gonna give us the directions from getting from point A to point B. So think of this as your, uh, your the ways app of ArcGIS. So we have our two points and our line shown on the map, and that's great, but for a human being, that still doesn't get us how to get from point A. So from our results, we can actually pull out driving directions from there. So what I'm doing is after I geocoded, and from that solver response, not only do you get geometries, you get actual driving directions, and we can use pandas to visualize it, or you could even export it out to CSV or any other format that you want, so you can give it to your users and provide it. And that's just some interesting things that you can do with Network Analyst. All right, so I'm going to jump over to geo-enrichment, which is the next topic we're gonna talk about. And what geo-enrichment is, it gives us the ability to take information and get more information about that. So you could have a point, polygon, or line, and you can enrich that data to get statistics and other pieces of information that you might not have had before to make your data better. So you could have your own proprietary information, but if you need other information to add to it, you would use geo-enrichment to do this. So we're gonna to connect to ArcGIS Online, and we're gonna continue moving on. When you import tools, it's bad form to use star, so you only wanna import what you wanna do. So in this case, we're gonna do from ArcGIS.geoenrichment, and we're gonna import get countries, country, enrich, create reports, and buffered study area. So that's what I'm gonna use in this whole module. To see the coverage that we have, we're gonna use the function get, get countries, and you can see, and we, we can see all the different countries that are available of pieces of information. We have 137 currently at the moment, and here's just a list of the first 10, from Albania to Azerbaijan. We can filter countries by location and by continent. So let's say you want to focus in on Australia, you would put Oceania. If you want to look at South America, like I did here, you could pass that in and it gives the countries associated with that area of where there's coverage. We can discover information about the country. So we could get it for the US or we could get it for, let's say, Chile. We pass it in and we see that we're actually working with Chile on our variable, which is expected but then we can access the individual data collections that fall within that country that we have access to. And here's just the first five. So this is various information about age and population based upon certain age groups. And it also gives you the source of when this information was last obtained. So for this case, this information was from 2016. You could filter it by date as well by using simple Panda query functions. So just to give an example, the US has over 14,000, almost 15,000 data sets, while Chile only has 147. So some countries are, have more data associated with it than others. If we wanna go and we wanna look at, the, we can then break down, let's say we know the collection we wanna do. So for example, we're gonna use the US here, and we know we wanna work with the data collection of age. We can then go down and see which subcategory actually exists within that age um, analysis, and we can print them out. So if you want to work with a specific group, this maybe males 30, or you want to compare males age uh, 30 to 35 to females age 30 to 35, you would just take those two columns and then do your analysis against them. Here's an example of some other ways you can display the data. 
So once again, it's always important to look at the vintage from when the data was updated. You don't want to, if you're looking for modern census data, you don't want to pull something from 1918 that's historic in there. So you always want to make sure you pull the right vintage of the uh, data set that you work with. You can then go ahead, once you know the categories that you want, and enrich that data. So you pass in the study area that you're interested in. In this case, we're just enriching by address and you pass in the data collection that you want to do with. So instead of parsing it down to age uh, dot mail zero, so zero to a four, not including five, um, I'm saying age, so I want all age statistics for all genders displayed in there for that address. We can also generate reports off this. And there's different formats by default that you can do it. The default is PDF, but some actually allow you to export your reporting as XLS. And what the report does is it creates a rich, um, tapestry profile, for example, as a PDF, and you can view it. So just give me a second, I will show you what that looks like. This is using the create function. Now the nice thing about this, this is the default template that it comes with for, this, for the area that you're interested in. But you can fully customize this template. So if you don't like the Esri logo, replace it with your logo. Just make sure you give us attribution you know, for, for what you did, and so on and so forth. So you can adjust these, these tapestry, the, 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 um, all these different little background graphics and everything like that. So it's a very robust function, but it just, it's just basically to whet your appetite and give you some ideas of what you can do. We can also find it using the name statistical areas, and we saw this with the raster analysis function, if you can recall with that. So uh, I'm gonna do a trick that you can do with Jupyter Notebooks, and I'm gonna use put it into greedy mode, and that allows me to do dynamic typing. And what I'm able to do is, I, as I hit this dot notation, it'll build out a dictionary where I can just hit tab and it would fill in, it fills in California or San Bernardino. So it makes finding the areas you want very easy. And it, it's a nice little trick to know about, so I strongly recommend you play around with it. So we're gonna go down and just parse through the different areas, all the way down to track for the United States, or I can get it by geography. And we can display those named areas on the map, which I showed you before. Sorry, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna kinda skip. <laughs> um, we, we have uh, different geography levels for different countries, so if we were to look at, say, um, Australia, they don't call it municipalities or uh, they still have states, but then the next level down, which I would associate to counties, they call it local government areas. So the a API adapts to the language for the country. So it's not like we didn't try to Americanize everything. We tried to keep it as local as possible for each data set. We can, you can search by names using this. So let's say we wanted to find every, every count, uh, anything that's named Washington within the United States. Then here, and there's 519 of them. I didn't know that, but here's the first 10. And then we could go ahead and display that on the map so you could see where all the Washingtons are across the whole United States. You can filter also by geography levels. So we, we saw using that tab notation that sort of brought us down to the different levels, but if you wanna know before you start hitting that, the, the greedy syntax and going down and down and down to the more refined areas, you can just look at the actual levels and it, it varies by country. So, it, um, you know, we go down to block group, and, but it, in, in Chile or Australia, it might only go down to the local name areas. You can arrange by different or multiple different ways of, um, of geometries or by, um, so for example, let's say we want to look at Trenton and we want to enrich by Trenton. So we can pass in, I can do us.geography state New Jersey and then pass in the zip code for Trenton, which is 08628 if anybody's interested. You want to get some pork roll. Um, and we can enrich that data set and get back the age collection or any other collection we're interested in. And you can also enrich it by, uh, let's say you want to get all counties, but you don't have that data set. So you could, you could leverage the geo-enrichment API to pull in the geometries you need to do your enrichment level. So you don't have to go searching for the geography area, especially if it's a named area or a well-defined one. We have them all in there and we try to grab them from authoritative sources like the US Census or uh, other agencies that vary per country and you get back all the information you want. So here I'm enriching, uh, I'm getting all the age population, uh, age information for each county within the state of Delaware. And then you can go ahead and map that. 
using our mapping API and adding layer. In this case, I'm overriding the renderer and I'm using uh, class color renderers over the age of 65. And then you can also do comparisons on various levels. So let's say you want to compare statistics on counties versus the state as a whole. And this information actually comes back as a pandas data frame. So you can compare the information on that data collection on different geography levels as a whole. You can buffer locations using non-overlapping disks by providing the areas, but make sure you specify the unit, because if you don't specify the unit, you will get really weird uh, radii buffers, so it might come back in decimal degrees and all this other stuff, and you'll wonder why it's not in the right unit. And you just have to set overlap to false, so recall when we did network analysts, they were all overlapping. If you don't want to have that overlap, you just set it to false. And the same thing with drive time. We can visualize those results quite easily. So here's two drive times, passing it in and visualizing it, and then all that information uh, appears as a rich uh, environment, so you get the pop-up feel just like you would with a JavaScript app. And then we can go ahead and persist that information back to our organization so you can save it for future use and share it with your colleagues around the way. So now we're gonna quickly switch over to John, who's gonna talk about mapping, and then we're gonna take questions. Thank you. Okay, some, some of this is, we've already used a lot of what I'm just gonna show you, so I'm gonna sort of breeze through some different things you can do with the map widget if you're interested in visualizing some of your results or some different data, and then we'll just open it up to questions, right? So again, you just once you have your GIS uh, modeled with the GIS class, there's a map method that you can enter all kinds of different properties to map uh, specifically where you're looking for, right? So it's centered on the USA, a different zoom level here. Um, typing in public, it's violating my rules. Um, so I can add, I can do a search for different layers by default, I get 10 back, I'm just gonna map one of them. I can add items directly into the add layer method and visualize those. Um, so there, I've added that. Um, there's, a, there's a legend you can add onto a map. that can be a helpful little widget. Um, so yeah, and then we can add a layer. You know, we've, we have seen, we've seen, we've been doing this all through the presentation, adding that freeway layer. That zoom level is not so helpful. So there you can add different symbol, symbolization. Then I take a look at the layers, I can remove that. And can draw on maps with We've got the ability to switch modes where you can go between two-dimensional and three-dimensional. This is so you can play around with visualizing your data there. And then you can save a web map directly from a Jupyter Notebook like this. Okay, so, done. <laughs> Questions? Wait, one, one more thing before that. I just wanna say one more thing. This is like my little sop, uh, soapbox moment. Uh, how can you get involved with all this? We listen to you. So if you go to github.com slash esri arcgis-python-api and you see a problem, that 
the developers, me, John, Rowit, all this, we look here first. So if you have a problem or a question, post it there first. We listen to you, we want you to be involved, uh, and we care about you. Uh, we're very passionate about what we do. So that's uh, just a little side note, and I really uh, thank you all for attending. We have questions, and I encourage you also, you know, some people are gonna uh, run off to please fill out the survey, and the feedback you leave really helps us. Um, Fives on the survey. Yeah. All five. All across the board. So uh, we're gonna open it up. So anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, is can you read local information? Uh, it's something we didn't demo here, but there's gonna be a, a whole session on it later. You can leverage spatially enabled data frames and you're able to read local data and then you can interact with your web map to do that. Very good question. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Yeah, right there. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great use case. And all this, we show a lot of our code using notebooks, but anything you see here, you can use in whatever ID, and then put it in a dot pi file, which is the more traditional way of doing it, encoding it, you wanna wrap it around Flask, go for it. I think that's awesome, and that's a great use case. Fuscate all the complicated things, make it easy for your administrators to get the information they need to do it. On the Jupyter Notebook interface, there's a, you can save out your Jupyter Notebooks as Python files. The only thing is, I mean, you're just not going to use the map widget inside yeah. your different environments. But anything you can do there, you can. You just have to set up your interpreter correctly in your IDE, and you're on your way. You, you, you could do that, and that's a very valid use case. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, there is an interface for symbology. In rpy.mapping, there's a generate renderer in there. Uh, we did everything manual to sort of show how you can just do it manually, but we do have helper functions for generating symbology. It's just, we just ran out of time. So, I thank you, you're welcome. Any questions from this side? I keep looking that way. No, yes, sir. Uh, yes and no, uh, you can use standalone services from ArcGIS Online. You can take an object like a, a hosted feature service layer and pass in the URL. Um, if, it has, if it has protection on it, you can use, there's a class called services directory, which is sort of like the cattle, uh, if you were to go to your um, ArcGIS server through the view, if you're gonna think about it, it's that view, so it's the slash uh, web adapter slash rest services, the path to your uh, service. So yes, you can do it with it unfederated, even if it's protected by username, password, or whatever else. So as long as I have the service registered with ArcGIS Online or with my own portal, I can still connect to it. Uh, so the follow-up follow question was about uh, can he use it if it's registered? It doesn't even have to be registered, you just have to be able to access it. Yep, no problem. Any other? I, I'm sorry, can you say that please? Yes, you can save the output and persist it. You can save it either as a local file or you can save it to your enterprise. Yes. Yeah, some, some of the tools have credit uh, consumption and some don't. Um, there, there's an estimate credit tool that you can use, especially on the, some of the uh, feature analysis stuff that we showed. And what you would do is you plug in all your parameters and you just say, uh, there's a, a true false and it says if you estimate equal to true and it'll analyze it, it won't actually do the analysis for you, but it'll tell you how many credits you get back as a float. Any other questions? Well, thank you. You've been a great audience. I really appreciate it. Please fill out the survey.